Hi, my name is Mike Conley, owner of East Bay Property Management, and my webinar is entitled, Should I Hold, Sell, or Exchange My Rental Property? And what I want to do is start off my webinar by telling you a little bit about who I am, who my brother is. We work together. So you've heard of the Wright Brothers, maybe you've heard of the Doobie Brothers. Well, I don't know if you've heard of the Conley Brothers, but that's my brother Tom and I. We're lifelong East Bay residents. We both went to UC Berkeley. We're both brokers who own rentals ourselves. And uh, myself, I own East Bay Property Management. Currently, we manage about 490 properties. Here's our staff. And uh, we're located right here in the center of Fremont. My brother Tom owns a real estate company called Landlord Realty. And all he does is work exclusively with landlords who own rental property that have decided to sell them. And this is his little team down here. Notice how we've uh, changed shirts. It's pretty much the same staff. We work side by side. Now let me tell you a little bit about who you are in case you've started this webinar saying, hey, who am I? I'm going to tell you. You're one of 18,000 East Bay landlords. There are 18,000 landlords in uh, eight East Bay cities that own a rental house. 95% of you own just one rental. You lived in it maybe for a period of years, decided to move into a, a larger house or a different location and keep that home. That's a typical landlord. Uh, you have a very low cap rate on your rental house. Your cap rate, as I'm going to show you, is between 2 and 3%. That's very low. And you have a desire for some real estate investment investor basics. That's what we're going to cover in the next 20 to 25 minutes here. And you are an investor. That's how you have to see yourself. If you own a rental home, you're an investor. There are real estate investors all over the country that would kill to have uh, uh, the equity that a lot of you have in just one rental house. So in our agenda, we're going to talk about a cap rate analysis of your rental. We're going to look at the basics of a 1031 exchange, the pros of a rental home. We're going to look at the ideal rental home. We're going to look at a rental home versus a rental condo or townhouse. We're going to look at out-of-state rental homes, the pros and cons of investing in commercial, how a database called CoStar can be your best friend. We're going to look at investing in multifamily with a 6 to 8 percent cap rate. And then we're going to conclude by looking at how you can get maximum price if and when you decide to sell your rental house. So to start, let's look at the cap rate. The cap rate is the rate of return on any investment. It's the most important financial equation for any real estate investor. And guess what? 90% of the investors I talk to have no idea what a cap rate is. <clears throat> so I'm going to share with you how to calculate a cap rate. First of all, let's take a typical Fremont rental three bedroom house. The estimated gross monthly rent of that three bedroom house each month is $3,100. That includes gardening. Estimated yearly gross rent, $37,200. So that's your gross rent. Now here are your expenses. Your property taxes are about $6,000. Could be higher, could be lower, depending on when you bought the house. But that's just the average. The property insurance on that house is about $2,000 a year. Then you've got the maintenance. That includes the gardening every month, the future rehab, uh, repairs. That comes to about one month's rent, $3,100 a year. Then you've got your property management. That's uh, about 8% of your gross rent, so that's $2,400. Then you've got to factor in your vacancy, which is uh, typically about 3% here in the Bay Area. For every three years that you have a home rented, for one month, it's going to be vacant between tenants. So that comes to about 3%. So your total expenses for your rental home equal $15,360. You deduct that from your yearly gross rent 
of 37,200, you come out to your net operating income of 22,770. Then you take your net operating income and you divide it by what you could sell your home for today. The average home in Fremont, three bedrooms, is right around 975, and that is going to give you your cap rate. Net operating income divided by what you would sell the home for today. A lot of you might be saying, hey Mike, what about my mortgage? Where does my mortgage factor into this? The cap rate equation assumes that your home is paid for, even though for most of you it's not. But that, um, uh, your mortgage is not factored into your expenses. It assumes that the home is paid for. So when you take 22,770 divided by 975,000, you come to a cap rate of about 2.3%. All the cap rates in the Bay Area for rental homes are between two and two and a half percent. Now the question becomes, is this a good cap rate? And this is what I used to say. I used to say, well, that depends on your risk tolerance and what you foresee with appreciation in the coming years. But here's the reality. The current reality is that 2.3% cap rate is the worst cap rate of any type of rental property in the entire United States. You look anywhere, East Coast, West Coast, down in the South, Northeast, Northwest, any kind of rental property, apartments, warehouse, office, retail, houses, nothing's worse than 2.3%. Now, I want to look at um, the uh, last 40 years, because in the last 40 years, there have been four major real estate cycles in the Bay Area. And when in every cycle, you have your recession, your recovery, your bubble, and your pop. So you go back to 1982, we had a recession there thanks to the SNL crisis. Then we had a period of recovery. In 1989, though, we had another SNL crisis along with the Loma Prieta earthquake. So we had a bubble and a pop, and then we had a recession, and then we had a recovery until the 2000 dot com bust. Again, uh, we had a bubble and a pop, period of recession, a long recovery right up to 2007. 2007, we had a lot of subprime lending, a lot of homes were overpriced, and we had a bubble and pop. The recession lasted two years, and we've been in an extended recovery. This, in fact, is the longest recovery that we've uh, had in the last 40 years. Everybody has been predicting, when are we going to see the next bubble? When are we going to see the next pop? But the, uh, um, you know, that's why they call it a bubble, because you just can't see it. Now I want to show you what the affordability index looks like. The affordability index by county, if you look at in Alameda County, the medium home price is $890,000 here in spring of 2020. That means that you're, you're going to have a monthly payment, including taxes insurance, of $4,820. This is the minimum qualifying income you must have to buy that house. And only 20% of households, that's husband and wives working together, can afford a home in Alameda County. Contra Costa County, it's a little different. You've got a medium home price of $638,000. Here's your monthly payment. This is the minimum qualifying income. That's why 33% in Contra Costa County can afford a home. And then you look in San Francisco, the median price of a home there is over $1,500,000. This is the monthly minimum payment that you're going to have purchasing that home at 20% down. This is the minimum qualifying income. That's why only 15% of households in San Francisco can afford a house. That's why many people are moving out of the Bay Area to places like Fresno, where you have an average home price of 269000 a monthly payment of fourteen sixty. This is the monthly minimum income per household you need to qualify, and that's why forty-six percent of the households in Fresno can afford to buy a house. So, when the statewide affordability index 
averages right now currently about 20%. So this is taken from the uh, Bay Area MLS at the very end of 2019. Let's bring it back to the, to, uh, the East Bay here. In um, Fremont, the medium home price in 2019 was 981. That's down 6.7 percent from 2018. Union City down 8 percent. Newark down 9.9 percent. Hayward only down 3.9 percent. Milpitas down 9.8. Pleasanton down only 6.2. Castor Valley 2.4. So um, this kind of gives you an idea that prior to the coronavirus, we were seeing a slip in medium home prices here in the East Bay. And nobody has a crystal ball, but I see an extended flat period um, of at least three to five years before prices start ticking up again. Now, this is uh, the reason I bring up appreciation is because it uh, relates to finding the sweet spot of your rental property. So every uh, rental property has three circles, cap rate, risk, and appreciation. And ideally, you want these three circles to overlap that give you a large gray area right here where you're seeing a uh, overlap of these, um, these three circles. You want a high cap rate, you want low risk, and you want high appreciation. And that this is what the average home looked like if you were buying it back in 2009 or 2010. You had a big sweet spot. But now, a rental home in the East Bay looks more like, oh, this is where the investor wants to be. But now, when you look at the sweet spot currently, this is what it looks like. You have still very low risk with a rental home, but you have a very low cap rate and you're getting no appreciation. That's why a lot of owners of rental homes in the East Bay are thinking of selling their rental and doing what's called a 1031 exchange outside of the Bay Area because you just can't right now get a uh, sweet spot this large. But you can find them in other parts of the country. So if your cap rate is 2.3% and your appreciation is maxed out, now is the time to at least consider, to think about a 1031 exchange. What is a 1031 exchange? It allows landlords like yourself to sell your current rental home and take the proceeds from that sale and invest it in another rental property in the United States. You have 45 days from the time that you close escrow on the, the sale of your current rental home to identify new rental property or properties. You can identify uh, several rental properties. You have 180 days to close escrow on those new rental properties. And it can be any type of rental. If you're selling a rental house, you don't need to purchase another rental home in uh, Kansas City, Missouri, or. Um, Phoenix, Arizona. It can be a retail property, an office property, an apartment, a duplex, a warehouse, even land. Any kind of rental property will um, meet the IRS criteria. And it, it can be of lesser, equal, or greater value than the property you're selling. It can actually be uh, of less value. Why would you do a 1031 exchange? Well, as we mentioned, to get a, a greater cap rate, to trade your current 2 to 3% cap rate for a cap rate of 5 to 8%. And the second biggest reason is that you're going to avoid capital gains taxes. So if you sell your current rental house, um, you're going to be taxed approximately 33% by the state, the Fed, uh, you've got uh, Obamacare, depreciation recapture. It all adds up to about 33% of the difference between what you sell your home for, less selling expenses, um, the, the difference between that number and what you purchase the home for and whatever uh, money you put into the home. Whatever that difference is, you're going to be taxed 33%. There is no way 
you want to give that to the government. <clears throat> you want to do a 1031 exchange. So another reason to do a 1031 is because the appreciation of your current rental home is going to be flat for a period of years, like we've talked about. And maybe your current uh, rental property has issues. Maybe it's 40 years old or 60 years old or in a rough neighborhood. If it's an older house, you're going to have um, issues with uh, your um, plumbing and your uh, HVAC and your electrical. So it, um, it might be in a tough area. It might be in a city like Hayward that has very stringent rent controls and is very pro-tenant. So um, and, uh, it's a, a reason to do a 1031 exchange. Maybe your current property is geographically undesirable. You live far away from the rental. Um, and you want to, you, you have a, you'd feel, be more comfortable if you were closer to it. Or maybe it's in a city that you uh, don't see a lot of um, uh, growth happening. Then um, maybe you're in a property right now with siblings or partners that don't see eye to eye. Another reason to do a 1031. You do a 1031 to diversify or expand your portfolio. I see it every day long, every day dealing with owners. They started with a rental home, let's say in Fremont, and then they did a 1031 a few years down the road and bought two apartment complexes in the Central Valley. And then they owned that for a, a number of years and then they ended up buying a, um, uh, two homes back in the Bay Area and then uh, ended up buying a commercial property somewhere around uh, the uh, Sacramento area that you trade up and expand your portfolio. This is how you do it with a 1031 exchange. Now let me give you, I'm going to switch gears here and give you 10 reasons why I like rental homes to invest in rental houses. First of all, they're going to appreciate about 5.4% every year. That's been the U.S. average for the last 50 years. Your vacancies are much less volatile with a rental house. And the house's value is not dependent on whether it's rented or not, like it is with commercial property. Your lending restrictions are going to be more favorable than they would be with commercial property. You're going to have more buyers for your house when you get ready to sell it than you are for commercial property. When you buy a home, it's usually from an anxious seller. But when you buy a commercial property or apartment building, it's often from a seasoned investor. In turn, when you sell a home, it's to a end user. But when you sell a commercial property, it's to a seasoned investor. And a well-located lo home will often fare better during a recession than most apartments or commercial buildings. You can still be diversified by owning a variety of homes. And you're already familiar with being a landlord of a rental house because that's what you're doing right now. And th these were all taken from Building Wealth One House at a Time by John Schwab. Great book. Now, if I had a magic wand, because I manage a lot of rental houses in the East Bay, and if I had a magic wand and could create the ideal rental house here in the East Bay, this is what it would look like. And then you can kind of see how your home compares to these. First of all, it would be four bedrooms or the ability to add a fourth bedroom. About 80% of rental homes in the East Bay are three bedroom. But when you have a fourth bedroom, you have a distinct advantage because so many people now are working out of their home. They want a fourth bedroom for an office. Uh, 1400, 1,400 to 1,600 square feet. Any bigger than that, it's overkill. <coughs> Your um, high quality tenant doesn't need a home much bigger than 1,600 square feet. I like a home with a family room, living room, and dining room. I like a home on a quiet street, a court is preferred. I like a small yard because most of my tenants, uh, you know, they, they're not barbecuing in the backyard. They, they aren't using their backyard or front yard much. And it's just less upkeep. Two car garage, double pane windows, no pool, no fireplace. I like a home that is close to fr the freeway or BART within one or two miles. Uh, I, obviously, great schools is, uh, uh, makes a huge difference in where you buy a rental house. 
I love to be able to walk to an elementary school. M most tenants uh, have elementary school children. Usually when their uh, uh, children are high school age, then they, they've bought a home by that time. I like a uh, home with good neighbors. So when I'm looking at a rental house to manage, I look at the home on the left and right, the home across the street. I want, I want to see good uh, neighbors. Every now and then, I look at a, a home that I'm going to be managing and I go, oh my gosh, look at the home next door. It's a wreck. Weeds are three feet high and uh, it's just not being cared for. That's going to hurt in my ability to um, find a great tenant. You want to be in an area with low crime, close to shopping in downtown. And if it has two stories, I love to have a full bedroom and bathroom on the first floor for the in-laws that visit during the summer. All right. Now, investing in a rental home or rental condo, which is better? They both have pros and cons. For a condo or townhome, it's more affordable. It's usually about half the price of a home. You have a slightly higher cap rate with a condo or townhouse. You're going to attract a larger pool of applicants because it's uh, less expensive. You're going to have lower rehab costs bete between the tenants. Your exterior maintenance is covered by the HOA. Your landscaping is covered by the HOA. You've got a lot of neighbors watching your property for you. There are a lot of eyes on your property. So your tenants um, are going to have to behave themselves. And um, that, those are the advantages of a condo townhouse. Now the pros for a home, you're going to have a little greater appreciation, less turnover. People that rent a home stay a little bit longer. You're going to, you're going to be able to make modifications to the home. You're going to have no HOA fees, no special assessments like you do with um, a condo or townhouse. So if I had my pick, I would probably lean towards a rental house just because of the uh, special assessments that come up every few years with um, homeowner associations that are not managing their budget properly. So let's see how your current rental home measures up. Okay, you're here in a single family house in the East Bay with a current 2019 value of around 900000 if it's a three bed, two bath house. You're only getting 3000 a month in rent. See, this is why your cap rate here in the Bay Area is so low, because the home values are just so great compared to the rent that you can get for them. That's why your cap rate is only 2.3. Now, we had a negative 4% appreciation from 2020 to 2019, or excuse me, 2019 to 2018. Um, there is a low risk factor in a a rental house. As we talked about, uh, it's, it's a low risk investment. But if you're managing it yourself, it's a little riskier. It's, I, I give it on a scale of one to five, five being high risk, one being, or excuse me, <clears throat> five being a, uh, a high risk, one being a low risk. I give it a 1.5 if you're um, uh, having a property manager manage it. Three, if you're having, a, if you're managing it yourself. So here's your yearly gross income, thirty-six thousand. But let's just say you looked at a retail strip center in Fresno for nine hundred thousand. This is what your monthly gross rent's going to be, eighty-two hundred instead of three thousand. You're going to have a cap rate of six percent instead of two point three percent. And guess what? Last year, twenty nineteen to twenty eighteen. Uh, Fresno commercial went up 2% as opposed to the Bay Area going down 4%. So you've got to look, there's 250 real estate cycles in the country. Every uh, uh, area you know, has their own cycle. So the cycle down in Fresno is different than the cycle in Sacramento, which is different than the real estate cycle in the East Bay compared to Marin. A lot of different cycles that um, have different appreciations. Now your risk factor for a retail strip center is a little greater than it would be for a home here in the East Bay. But if you can tolerate that risk, you're going to make a lot more monthly income with a retail strip center in Fresno than you would with a single family home in the Bay Area. 
And so I go over in my two hour seminar, which is free. I hold them every 90 days here in my office. I go over all of these in greater detail, but I just wanted to give you a highlight of how um, your current rental home measures up to other places in the country. You want to look for the 1% rule. That's, that's kind of the investor litmus test around the country. You want to be able to get a rent that is equivalent to 1% of what you paid for the rental property. So if you paid $100,000 for a rehab rental home in Kansas City, that's about the medium rental price, and you can get 1000 a month in rent for it, you've met the 1% rule. You can't even come close to that here in the Bay Area. Uh, it's more like 0.03%. So that's the 1% rule. My motto is always live where you want to live, but invest where the numbers make sense. Now, chasing yield or cap rate outside of the Bay Area. Um, basically, I, I won't go into detail on this chart, but I, I, I have identified 12 criterion that you want to use to help you evaluate where, not just what city, but what part of the city, what neighborhood in the city you want to invest in uh, rental real estate. And uh, these criteria are that the cap rate must be 5% or higher, at least a 2% home appreciation over the last 12 months, population growth, household income, medium rent, 2% or higher job growth, poverty level under 20%, median income up 30%, since the year 2000. Home values up 40% since the year 2000. Neighborhood unemployment rate low. Ethnic mix having two slices in a pie chart and crime rate index under 500. What you want to do is use these 12 criteria. Um, you just simply want to check the boxes. So if you're looking at a place like a suburb of Overland Park in Kansas City and it checks 10, 11, or 12 of the boxes, that's a great place to buy rental real estate. Or uh, Clovis or Sacramento or Central Florida, there are a number of different hot spots in the country that meet all 12 of these criteria. How does the East Bay do? It meets, I believe, five of them. Five, five of the 12 criteria. It's not a good place to buy rental real estate. Matter of fact, when somebody calls me and says, Mike, I'm interested in property management, I'm looking at buying a rental real estate uh, property here in the East Bay. I ask them, why are you doing that? Why are you spending so much property, so much money for a rental property that um, is only going to produce a 2 or 3% cap rate? The benefits of investing in commercial property, retail, office, or warehouse. First of all, you can get a higher cap rate because you're going to have less competition. You're going to have fewer headaches, often but not always, with the property itself and the tenant. You're going to have a stable cash flow. You're going to be able often to get a longer lease. You can get bumps in rent. Your tenants sometimes will pay the taxes, insurance, and maintenance. And you've got multiple ways to add value to that property with reduced vacancy, rehab, raising the rent, making improvements, reducing expenses. The one caveat of owning commercial property, you have to hustle to fill a vacancy. I personally own three commercial properties, 18 tenants, and uh, I'm down at the properties or in the Central Valley about once every six weeks to fill a vacancy. I've got to hustle, but it's worth it to me. Let me give you a short case study of invest investing in commercial uh, real estate with a 1031, and this is uh, me personally. Okay, I was uh, partners in a uh, retail center here in uh, Fremont, an area called Irvington, and we had a number of uh, retail tenants producing about a 5% cap rate, but the anchor tenant was struggling. We had partners, my two brothers and I, we had different goals, and we ended up selling the home, uh, selling the uh, property rather, in um, November of 2017 to a home builder. They uh, changed the zoning and were able to uh, build uh, high density residential homes, 80 of them, on the uh, four acre site. 
So I did, we all went our separate ways, I did a 1031 exchange into three commercial properties in the Central Valley. The first property was a 13-tenant retail building in Clovis, 11,850 square feet. I purchased it for $1,160,000, and this is my net operating income, $103,000, an 8.8% cap rate compared to a 2.3% cap rate for a home here in the East Bay. Then the second property I bought, remember I, I only had 180 days to close on these properties in order to avoid a large 33% capital gains tax. So the second property I bought in foreclosure was a Napo Auto Parts store in Fresno. It was six, it's 6,800 feet, so a big uh, warehouse, small showroom. I purchased it from the bank for 402,000. Here's my net operating income, 30,876. Uh, That's a 7.7% .7 cap rate with an A1 tenant that signs five-year leases like clockwork. They've been there 15 years. And then the, finally, the third property, was a property also down in the Fresno area, a town called Sanger. It was a little five-tenant office retail building, 4,950 square feet. Uh, I also bought this in foreclosure. They were asking 499,000. I purchased it for 430,000. My net operating income is 40,196, a 9.3% cap rate. How did I buy these three properties? How did I identify them? because um, you only have 45 days to identify your replacement property once you close escrow on the property that you're selling. Let me share with you how. A, um, two things. A realtor that understands the 1031 process, that's my brother Tom Conley, and a database called CoStar. CoStar will help you find a 5 to 8 percent cap rate here in California. What I did was I went to my brother Tom and I said, Tom, here is here are the filters that I want us to put into CoStar. I want <clears throat> a, uh, the type of property I want is retail. Let's put that in the filter. I want a price between $100,000 and $2 million. I want a price per square foot maximum of $100. So if I'm looking at a a uh, 5,000 square foot building, I don't want to pay any more than 500,000 for it. I want a lot of square footage for my money. That way when the recession comes and I've got to reduce rents a little bit, I'm not going to be uh, devastated. I want a cap rate of 8% minimum. I want a location 150 miles from Fremont or closer. And what Tom did after putting those parameters into his database called CoStar, which is a very expensive commercial uh, database, he came up with 80 properties for sale in the, in, within a 150-mile radius of Fremont. In addition, he came up with 80 properties that had recently been for sale but taken off the market. That was 160 total properties. So what I did was simply send a letter of intent to all 160 of those um, property owners or realtors who had them listed, and I offered them 66% of what they were asking in uh, price. And I emphasized it was for a 1031 exchange, which lets them know I'm serious, I have money. Of those 160 letters I sent out, 60 responses saying, come talk to us, we're interested. And so for the next several weeks, I just traveled all over the state evaluating each of these properties. That's something that no realtor could ever provide you with unless they understood the 1031 process like my brother Tom does and had CoStar. A typical realtor, if you were selling your rental property and wanted to do a 1031 exchange, would be lucky if he showed you one uh, commercial property that made sense. And you, what you want is to be able to mine through a lot of nuggets to find the, the uh, actual real gold. So after looking at all of these properties over a period of weeks, I came up with the three properties that I showed you down in Fresno, Sanger, and Clovis. 
that made sense. And that's exactly uh, how you can um, re uh, find properties in California at a six to eight percent cap rate. Now, you're probably saying, but Mike, what about the wonderful appreciation that we get here in California? Why would I sell my rental house and go out of state, maybe to Florida or Kansas City when, or even Fresno or Sacramento when we're getting great appreciation in the Bay Area? That's a myth. The, you look at California's appreciation over um, the last 50 years, it's about 6.38%. The national average for appreciation for um, property is 5.4%, a very small difference. And then you might be asking, well, what about my property taxes? Because my property taxes right now, Mike, are very low. I bought my rental property many years ago, and thanks to Prop 13, my taxes haven't gone up but maybe 2% a year. Well, if you calculate a cap rate that is so much greater than your current cap rate, the difference in property tax becomes minuscule. It's insignificant. And I go over that in my seminar. It, it, it's almost irrelevant. So uh, don't worry about your property taxes. So you take away the myth of appreciation here in California being greater than the rest of the country and the myth of your property taxes, you have to tell me why you would want to keep a rental house in the East Bay at a 2.5% cap rate when you could sell it and exchange it with a 1031 for cap rates two to three times greater. There's just absolutely no reason not to do it. What matters with your property is not the goose. What matters are the golden eggs the goose lays. See, so many people say, Mike, but this is the house I raised my family in. This house has sentimental value. I love going and being able to drive by it. That house is just a goose. What matters are the golden eggs that it lays. You've got to think about the 1% rule. Getting 1% in rent uh, uh, compared to what you paid uh, for the property. You want to live where you want to live, but you want to invest where the numbers make sense. Now, let me talk just for a, a minute on my brother Tom, okay? He owns a company called Landlord Realty, and his whole uh, motto is selling your rental home at maximum price. And Tom is a landlord himself. You know, only 5% of realtors own rental property themselves. Tom owns a number of rental properties. He's done several 1031 exchanges himself. All of his rental property is here in the East Bay, most of it in Hayward. He understands tenants. He knows rehab. So what he's gonna do is go into the home with you prior to the tenant moving out, and he's gonna go in with his board, and his board has all the uh, samples of laminate, and uh, tile, uh, kitchen cabinets, baseboards. He's going to talk about recessed lighting. He's going to uh, talk about what's needed for your yard. He's going to talk about rehab because he knows it. He knows just uh, the right amount of rehab too. Uh, to where every dollar you put into rehab, you're going to get at least a dollar and a quarter, dollar fifty added to the sales price. And of course, he's experienced with the 1031 process. As I mentioned, he'll, um, he can help you uh, identify replacement property. <clears throat> so this is my brother, Tom. Bottom line is he's gonna sell your rental at the maximum price. Now here's just an example of uh, some homes that he sold recently. This home here was in Pleasanton, three bed, two bath, and he did a uh, CMA on the home in as-is condition, and it came to 840000 if they'd sold it as-is. This is after the tenants moved out. But Tom and the owner were able to agree to do $75,000 in rehab, which Tom paid for himself and then was reimbursed at the close of escrow. But the owner did not have 75000 to put into it. Tom funded the rehab, which he would do for you, and doesn't no markup, no uh, contractor fee or anything like that. And by putting seventy-five thousand in rehab, he was able to sell it for one million ten thousand, 
which put an extra $95,000 in the owner's pocket. You never want to sell a rental home as is. You want to do the rehab yourself. Don't give that sweat equity to the buyer. And these are just some more pictures of, of uh, uh, Tom, Thomas, uh, many homes, many homes that have come from uh, referrals from myself. Uh, and they've all, uh, he, he's done uh, the rehab on all of them. So if you wait for perfect conditions, you'll never get anything done. It's one of my favorite scriptures. As many of you are saying, well, Mike, um, maybe next year, maybe uh, you know, down the road. But the bottom line is that we could very well be in for an extended flat period appreciation wise. Uh, this is the time to be looking at your cap rate and doing a 1031. So what, uh, what you got here was a taste of my full two hour seminar that I put on every 90 days, same title, should I hold, sell, or exchange my rental? We're gonna go uh, uh, more in the depth than we did here today. And it's a free seminar and I have it here in my office. Anywhere from 100 to 150 landlords show up on a Saturday two hours long from 10 to 12. I provide brunch and all you have to do if you're interested is text me at my cell 510-996-3238 saying reserve me a spot for your next seminar. And I'll have your text number, I'll reserve you a spot and I'll see you then. Thanks for watching and uh, happy landlording.